For as savage a practice as war is, there are generally accepted rules to it. And one of those rules is prisoners of war be kept safe and protected for the duration of their time behind enemy lines. The Geneva Convention has been dictating the treatment of soldiers in the battlefield since 1864. Trying to add civility to war seems like an oxymoron, but it's something that has to be done. Sometimes, though, the rules of war are one of the casualties. Most people don't realize the Axis powers had technically put boots on American soil during the Second World War. Of course, that's understandable, as it didn't happen in the way many would imagine. Rather than coming in the form of a full-scale ground invasion, the German and Italian soldiers who made their way stateside were actually taken there as prisoners. It was in 1943, two years before the worldwide conflict came to an end, that the U.S. began playing host to prisoners of war who'd been captured in both Europe and North Africa. Of course, agreeing to do so meant they'd first have to build a vast network of prison camps in various spots across the country in order to accommodate their new guests. Of the places where those camps were created, perhaps none is more notorious in hindsight than Salina, Utah the very town where the predictably named Camp Selena sat. The reason for its notoriety was because, despite it being a simple complex made up of only 43 tents, an officer's quarters, and three guard towers, it housed around 250 German prisoners at its peak, most of whom had come in from the Africa Corps, so there was always a sense of busyness to the place. But that seemed to be exactly what the U.S. military wanted, as each man being held there was put to work harvesting sugar beets and other produce. While that could have been a tiresome and difficult task, according to first-hand accounts at the time, not only did the prisoners do their jobs without complaint, but they were also very well-behaved and friendly whenever they encountered locals from the Salina area during their stay there. So, given how cordial they were being, it made sense that they be treated kindly by their captors in turn. Sure, these men represented the enemy, but they were still human beings and so deserved to be looked upon as such as for as long as they were under U.S. custodianship. Unfortunately, though, while that was the case for the most part, there were instances of guards at Camp Selena not looking upon their captives too kindly. Part of the reason for that was because many of the people posted there suffered from things such as behavioral problems that made it difficult for them to regulate their emotions in a normal, healthy way. As it turned out, whenever a soldier was deemed unfit for frontline service, it wasn't uncommon for them to be sent to one of the POW camps around the country and made to serve their time there instead. Obviously, that created a clear issue, as while the Geneva Convention stated anyone being held in internment during times of war were to be treated with the utmost protection, protecting those who these angry young enlistees saw as the enemy was not always at the forefront of their minds. Still, even if there was an underlying resentment over the fact that they had to care for German soldiers when what many of them really wanted to be doing was going over to Europe and fighting those same people instead, the guards of Camp Salina and others like it did behave themselves for the most part. After all, if they didn't do so, then the threat of punishment was severe and few wanted to risk being court-martialed or sent to prison. That's why, even if there was the occasional instance of internees not being treated well, the reputation the American prisoner of war camps had was relatively good, certainly far better than their Nazi and Russian equivalents, with most of the men held on U.S. soil describing them as firm but fair. All that changed in July of 1945, however, as it was then a true tragedy took place when Clarence Bertucci secured his place in infamy forever. But let's backtrack for a moment before going any further in order to get some context on who Clarence was and what exactly it was that drove this 23-year-old man from New Orleans to commit such an atrocity. In short, he was a troubled figure, like so many others who had been deemed unfit for action, and as a result he'd been posted in an alternative role instead as a guard at a POW camp. 
Now, what exactly the origins of his troubles were remains unclear, but it is a recorded fact that a loved one of his had died while fighting in Europe a few years prior, and so some have put his subsequent anger issues down to that incident. But then there's also the possibility his mental instability really began while he was still just 18 years old, as it was then that he had undergone an appendectomy, a procedure that required him to receive a spinal injection. As it turns out, the after-effects of the injection were what his mother blamed for his subsequent problems. Of course, it should be noted there's no actual medical evidence to suggest a spinal injection could have caused any of the later mental health issues Private Bertucci underwent, and so it remains mere speculation from a family member looking to desperately understand what her son did. It wasn't as if he didn't have behavioral problems prior to that. No, as far back as his school days, he was known for creating issues, with that being what led him to drop out during the sixth grade. And even when he joined the U.S. Army, they were largely unable to rein him in because during his five years of service, he'd been threatened with court-martial on two separate occasions on grounds of neglecting his duties. Those incidents all led to him being pegged as someone with a discipline problem who, as a result of his behavior, was unfit for any kind of promotion to a higher level. But promotion wasn't the only thing he was unfit for. No, combat was another aspect of the job Bertucci was denied access to as a result of his instability. That was something that allegedly made him very angry, with him later testifying he felt unsatisfied during his first few years in the service where he was largely confined to home soil outside of one eight-month tour in England, as he believed he'd been cheated out of the chance to kill some Germans. Yes, the Louisiana native clearly had one main goal when signing up for the service, and it wasn't to stand back while others were doing the shooting on the front lines. In fact, some of the people who knew him even recalled him once specifically saying, quote, Someday I will get my Germans. I will get my turn. So when he was eventually transferred over to guard duty at Camp Salina towards the end of the war, he must have realized that it was his opportunity to do just that. But even then, he would have understood all too well that he needed to pick his moment at just the right time as he'd only get one chance. That was why he waited, all the way up until both the Germans and the Italians had surrendered and the war formally ended in Europe. Once that happened and he realized the people he hated so much were going to be sent back home to be with their families soon, he decided he could wait no more and that he would have to exact his revenge while he still had the chance. That was where things stood on May 7th, 1945 as, with the plan being for the prisoners held at Camp Salina to be transferred back to Europe as soon as possible, Private Bertucci took to dealing with his anger by drowning his sorrows at the bottom of a bottle. On that day, he'd decide to go out drinking at a local bar, all before then stopping off at Mom's Cafe on Main Street in Salina sometime before midnight in order to grab a coffee and to speak to a waitress there he'd been friendly with. That conversation gave the first true indication as to what the private's plans were because up until then he'd shown no outward signs that he had any intentions of causing a scene. When he spoke to the waitress in question, he advised her that, quote, something exciting was going to happen. He advised her that she should watch for it on the news later. Needless to say, that cryptic statement puzzled the girl, but with it being Saturday night, she was so busy with her work she didn't have much time to give it a second thought. She just put it to the back of her mind as she carried on with her evening and Bertucci returned to Camp Salina. In hindsight, though, she likely wished she'd told someone about the young private's comments before he left as once he made his way back to his post, a massacre took place. Not that it probably would have made much difference if she had said anything, though, because his words were so vague there was nothing really to report anyway. It wasn't as if he was the only one who'd expressed a dislike toward the POWs in the past. It's just that no one else was unstable enough to put actions to their words. Private Bertucci, on the other hand, most certainly was. So, once he relieved the guard on watch duty at the Southwest Tower on midnight and took up the post himself, he waited for them to get out of sight, picked up a regulation 30 caliber M 1917 Browning machine gun, then threaded a 250 round cartridge belt into it and took aim at the tents below. What followed after that was nothing short of a catastrophe as bullets began raining down on the sleeping prisoners of war, leaving them with little chance to even realize what was going on before they were hit, let alone defend themselves. 
Over the course of a 15 second rampage, 30 of the 43 tents on site were struck and dozens were peppered with ammunition in a scene that briefly left the entire camp enveloped in dust. Even the locals who lived in Salina were woken up by the noise of what was taking place only a few hundred feet away. As Rodney Rasmussen, a citizen of Salina who was just six years old at the time of the incident, later recalled, quote, We came out onto the front porch and we could hear the cries of the prisoners. As he listened to the cries of those wounded and dying men, the youngster was also able to see the muzzle flash of Bertucci's machine gun off in the distance with that all serving to paint a gruesomely vivid picture in his mind of the massacre taking place, a picture which would stick with him for the rest of his life. Of course, even if Rodney and everyone else in town could figure out what was going on by then and could visualize it in their own mind's eye, at least they didn't have to see it directly. No, that particular horror was saved for Bertucci's fellow soldiers as at that point they were all alerted to what was happening and were in the middle of trying to stop it before things got even worse. Of those who were doing so, right at the front of the line was Lieutenant Albert Cornell, Clarence Bertucci's commanding officer. As it was later recalled, in fact, he repeatedly screamed at the young soldier to come down from the tower. But whenever he did, the only response he'd get would be a refusal on account of some of the prisoners still being alive. And the now crazed gunman at one point even shouted to him, quote, Send up more ammo, I'm not done yet. Clearly, he was a man beyond any type of reason, so after it became clear he couldn't be talked down, some of his fellow soldiers were sent to bring Bertucci under control physically, and he offered no resistance when that happened. Eventually, having done enough damage for one evening, he gave himself over willingly and allowed them to place him under guard at the 9th Service Command Headquarters in nearby Fort Douglas. That sudden spell of magnanimity did little to change the fact nine German soldiers were now dead, with them being 25-year-old Otto Brass, 24-year-old Ernst Fuchs, 29-year-old Gottfried Gog, 31-year-old George Lisk, 24-year-old Hans Meyer, 28-year-old Adolf Paul, 24-year-old Fritz Stockmann, 23-year-old Walter Vogel, and 48-year-old Friedrich Ritter. And it wasn't as if their deaths had been quick and painless either. No, their lives were taken in such a savage manner that one of them was just about cut in half during the storm of bullets. As if that wasn't bad enough, a further 19 POWs were also badly injured in the attack, so badly that each had to be immediately rushed to the hospital. Obviously, that only further drew the attention of the citizens of Salina as they watched in shock while a series of ambulances drove past carrying the critically injured men. Their shock and outrage only grew worse when those same men made it to the hospital and the blood loss incurred by them was so great it literally flowed out the front door and down Main Street. But that wasn't the only blood being lost now. Outside on the front lawn of the hospital, things were just as bad if not worse because the lone doctor and pair of nurses on call at the time had to deal with patients there too as there simply wasn't enough space inside the small hospital for everyone to fit. Yes, it was quite a scene and one that left the locals wondering how such a thing could have been allowed to happen. How could it have been that a massacre of such horrific proportions had taken place right on their doorstep and had been executed by one of their own? Well, the answer to that turned out to be simple in the end. In Bertucci's own words, he had hated Germans, so he had killed Germans. And now that his plan was complete, he felt proud of what he had done. The only thing he would have liked to have added to it was to kill more Germans, in fact. Thankfully, though, now that he was in custody, that wouldn't happen. But it didn't necessarily mean the trouble was over for Camp Selina quite yet. Given how many of their people had just been massacred, there were fears the remaining POWs would attempt to retaliate in the days that followed. Luckily, however, such fears proved to be unfounded, with a possible reason things remained as calm as they did being that the men just wanted to go home and didn't want to do anything else to jeopardize such an eventuality. Still, that wasn't to say they were going to forgive the deaths of nine of their compatriots, and neither was the nation of Germany, something the US understood all too well. 
So, in order to try and get ahead of the political fallout that was about to occur, they immediately assigned Captain Wayne Owens to investigate the incident, with him initially concluding that Clarence Bertucci had been sane when he did what he did and so should face court-martial for his actions. Many of Owen's superiors disagreed with his assessment and instead pushed for the killer private to be declared legally insane instead. Why would they go against the opinions of such a trusted military captain? Well, while it's possible they genuinely felt Bertucci had lost his mind, it's equally as possible they wanted him to be found insane as it would help to change the narrative from being that of an American-led massacre of prisoners of war to one of a crazed man's lone thirst for vengeance instead. Perhaps unsurprisingly then, it was the side of the superiors who won out in the end as, after being deemed to be mentally unstable by a panel of military officials, Private Bertucci was sent off to a mental health facility located at Mason General Hospital in New York where he'd spend the rest of his days up until he died on December 2nd, 1969 at the age of 48. As for his victims, well, those who had died would end up being buried at Fort Douglas Cemetery, with each of them being given full military honors from their home nation. As if that wasn't enough, a 17-member choir was also on hand to sing a variety of songs honoring the fallen. Though it should be noted that any Nazi music was specifically banned, and the tradition of adorning the men's caskets with their flags was foregone as by that point the updated German flag was yet to be created following the fall of the Third Reich. But the deceased weren't the only victims of what would become known as the Midnight Massacre, of course. No, there were also numerous injured as well. So what happened to them? Well, while they'd be sent back home to be with their loved ones as soon as they were deemed medically fit to travel, there were further issues awaiting them when they did. That was because, due to a prior agreement between the German and U.S. governments, wounded soldiers were not eligible for compensation from the opposing nation if they should be injured while on their soil. So, after enduring what they had experienced, the final insult for these men was that the only help they got once all was said and done was the same benefits offered to any other German veterans. Needless to say, all that left a black cloud over what should have been a time of celebration as now, rather than being able to toast the fact the war was on the verge of ending, the whole thing instead turned into something that most in the military wanted to forget. Sure, it wasn't the only time murders had been carried out at such camps. In fact, it wasn't unheard of for prisoners to occasionally take matters into their own hands prior to that and execute their own kind of makeshift honor courts, such as had happened at both Camp Concordia in Kansas and Camp Takawa in Oklahoma during 1943. The incident at Camp Salina represented something different as it was an American soldier carrying out the killings, and he was doing so purely on the grounds of hatred and rage. So, it's only right that in the years since, the site of the men's graves has had a war memorial installed next to it which was funded by Germany. As if that wasn't enough, in November of 2016, Camp Salina itself was transformed when it was turned into a museum designed to highlight the shameful events that took place there 81 years prior. Of course, that latter move was a particularly important one as by that point the whole thing had become so forgotten by the people living there, even then Mayor Dustin Deaton claimed he wasn't aware any such massacre had happened until after he was elected. With that fact in mind, it's important now than ever that the killings carried out by Private Clarence Bertucci don't slip into obscurity again. After all, as Tammy Olson Clark, citizen of Selena and daughter to one of the women who was there on the night of the massacre stated when asked during a news interview at the time of the museum's opening, quote, History is not pretty. Some parts of it is, but most of it's not, and we get to learn from that. Of course, that's only as long as we human beings are willing to learn from it. Thanks for letting us tell you this sinister story. If you enjoyed it, subscribe on whatever platform you're on and hit like, rate it, or leave a comment. Join us next week when we'll take you somewhere sinister.